the uh, program. I'm very excited, uh, as you all are excited, to hear from three of our wonderful NOFAMAS board and staff members who have given their time tonight to talk about seed starting. It's all about seed starting. And so we are joined tonight by Jason Valcor, our NOFAMAS conferences coordinator, and he's a home gardener from Swansea, Massachusetts. I think I saw some people from that area. Julie Rawson, NOFAMAS's executive director and farmer at Many Hands Organic Farm growing three acres of vegetables in Barry, Massachusetts. Those who are close by might be familiar with that. And it, we rounded out with Richard Robinson, NOFA Mass board member and farmer at Hope Still Farm, growing two acres of vegetable crops in Shearborn, Massachusetts. Now tonight's webinar, um, our format will be a talk. Each one of our panelists will give a talk on how they set up their seed starting operations and then it will be followed by a panel discussion with questions and answers. And if you joined a little earlier, you heard some of the questions that were coming through, some of the dialogue, so keep those questions coming. You can utilize the question feature or the chat feature to get those questions to us. Or if you are dialing in by phone, we do uh, recognize we have some people calling in, feel free to text me at 413-214 one two three seven that is four one three two one four one two three seven if you have a question and you are dialing in so we can uh, get you included in this wonderful discussion so without any further ado or delay i am going to start us out with jason valcor he is coming live he is live and in living color in this basement in swansea so he can start talking about his situation and his setup. And so Jason, if you are on mute, feel free to take yourself off of mute or I could do that for you. Okay, go ahead, Jason. All right, <clears throat> thank you so much, Anna. And thanks everyone for joining us. So glad that you're with us. And I love hearing that uh, there's folks from all over the place with us. <clears throat> I have to start off by saying that I've never had this many people in my basement. I probably never will again. So um, it's very nice that it actually doesn't feel crowded down here with 200 plus people in my basement. So um, that's a first here. But uh, I'm psyched to be with you. I'm going to show you my basement setup of my lights. I have a garden that is about 3,000 square feet. That is about 50 feet by 60. And I have nine beds laid out in straight rows with drip irrigation set up in the garden and i start all my plants uh primarily most of my plants here in the basement myself so behind me i have this big reveal that i'm about to give to you is um this shroud or uh it's kind of like a tarp i guess or a, a drop cloth really it's a drop cloth um, that i have encased a, a built-in table that came with the house that we purchased so it's a sturdy table that has a shelf down below um, and i have enshrouded it here to keep the heat in and this gets me because my basement is a little bit cool at about you know 58 degrees or so um, this actually gets me eight to ten degrees warmer in here and it fluctuates sometimes the temp will go up to about 72 which is really nice for most things maybe not lettuce but um, most things like this temperature works really well so um, this is where my seeds live and I uh, come down to work on my seeds and I do the big reveal here and hopefully you're able to get a sense of what I'm showing you here is I have uh, four four foot lights hung next to each other a combination of chain and some string material a lot of it's mostly chain um, this is just twine um, and the chain sections give me the opportunity to raise or lower depending on the height of the plants and of course i accidentally took it off the hook but that's a nice versatility allows me to just manually raise it up and down it's a little bit of a manual thing that i need to measure and eyeball but um, it's fine for me 
I have this wonderful tray underneath here, which is essentially a four foot by almost 24 inch foot, uh, 24 inch tray. And it fits the surface area under the lights perfectly. I can pull the entire tray out to water and push it right back in, put it equally up against the first light. And I just, I know that all the plants are under the lights. Um, you can see, I think that you can see down below there that I have two clip-on lights down below. They're just like, you know, just general clip-on lights. They cost a couple dollars in the store. Um, and they have a regular old bulb in there, uh, 40 watt or so. And I have two of them to, to warm up the bottom, keeps the temperature nice and well when these lights go off at night. I have all these lights on a timer and they stay on for about 14 hours now. I have it like 4 a.m. to whatever 14 hours is. So uh, 6, 6 p.m. or something like that. Um, so about 14 hours on the lights. Um, these are uh, fluorescent bulbs. They don't take a lot of um, energy. The particular housing here costs about $17 at the hardware store or the Home Depot, whichever is accessible for you. Um, the bulbs cost about $8 each, so each light costs around $32 or so to get into this setup. I'm going to turn these lights off so you can see. Maybe you can see a little bit better. Um, and I'm going to move my camera, so bear with me for a moment. So you can see where the magic is happening. Um, I have some onions started here. I have some broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower started um, in the peat pots in the front. I actually have an interesting situation. I had some um, winter squash seeds sprouting in my worm bins, which might be another webinar in the future. Um, and I found these sprouting seeds and I just planted them. So I'm, I'm psyched to have mystery squash seeds, which is really fun in a garden setting. You can do a lot of that. Um, I also have in the back, I have uh, microgreens that I grow, a whole tray of microgreens here. And um, those are getting a little bit leggy, but um, they're going to leaf out and I will eat those directly from the tray. Um, you can cut them once and they'll come again a little bit lighter. So you can usually get two harvests off of that sowing. I run out of space at a certain time of the year because I have uh, have an ambitious garden. You know, it is quite large for a home garden at 3,000 square feet. So um, I'm often having to balance what can stay under the direct lights and what needs to go up and be moved in and out of the house on a daily basis, um, which also helps with my hardening off process. It's kind of a natural capacity uh, issue that I have that once I'm over capacity here and things are big enough, I can bring them up. And I have another one of these trays that I can bring in and out of the house with help. Um, and during the day they go out, the wind blows them all around a little bit and they get natural light. Um, they get exposed to some lower temperatures and um, it allows me to manually create more capacity. Um, most, uh, all of my seeds are planted into a mixture of 50% organic compost and 50% of an organic potting soil. I just mix it half and half. Um, I suppose at, at this moment I'm wanting my seed starting mix to have a little more oomph, so I'm trying to solve for that. Not sure if I need to go heavier on the compost or um, I do try to give my plants a once a week dousing of um, fish fertilizer, a fish emulsion mixed into a gallon of water. Um, and I will water them once a week, then water that in. And that they really like that. Um, uh, so that's a strategy for me to give the, the plants the nutrients they need. 
Um, but I do want to solve for a more robust um, seed starting mix. Uh, let's see. So, um, how I water, primarily I water through my handy dandy little spray bottle. That's about it. Um, I do have another watering can, but when some starts are tiny, that much water can smush them down, so I try not to do that. I can either mist things because I don't have that much to mist, even though the hand does get tired, or I simply remove the top and I can water with a precision nozzle here that's not a big splash. I find that technique to work really well. Of course, I have water access in the basement, which is very handy too. Um, I do keep a seed log of all the things that I seed because I do have a farming background and I have a seed log. I, I love to know if I sowed uh, the seed on 320, 328, whatever. If I have a failure, I can trace it back to whatever seed packet I have um, to know that those seeds didn't work. And so I can know what to reseed or I can know what variety didn't work. Uh, so I love to keep a seed log even for my garden. Um, let's see, I think uh, as far as the mechanics of this setup, those are the main components. Got my four foot lights, I got a nice four foot tray. I have some heat underneath, keeps the temp up nice. I water with the spray bottle primarily, and I use half and half compost and potting soil. Um, so I love to seed into these um, these handy dandy trays that I have here and what I have uh, move the camera a little bit I have here I purchased some um, seeds from Johnny's some spinach this uh, I'm gonna try this Bloomsdale spinach this year because I was feeling it um, I also plant space as my primary spinach variety I also have kookaburra as another variety and typically when I see it a uh, something small like this it doesn't have to be very deep I'll take a uh, one of these little sticks <laughs> popsicle stick make a quick little trough this is probably something you're familiar with as well um, but I don't uh, I don't always poke individual holes. I'll just make a trough and then I'll drop seeds into that trough. I, um, I don't find like a spinach seed hard to handle. They're big enough that I can get a, um, you know, pretty much get a good, uh, get one seed out of my fingers at a time or pick up one seed. I'm giving these seeds about uh, an inch and a half of space or so. So that means I'll have, oh, about 10 or 12, depending how good my measurement is and how much I want to uh, squeeze some in there. I'll have 10 to 12 in there. So I'll have 24, you know, approximately 24 plants in this one tray. And when I plant it out into the garden, Oh, I'll probably give my spinach an eight by eight spacing. So 24 plants is only gonna take um, in, a, in a bed that has um, four, uh, four rows in it. It would be a 32 inch wide or so. I need 32 in my bed. Um, I, in a foot and a half, I can plant 24 plants, which is pretty significant for, um, my home, which is uh, there's primarily two of us, though I do feed, um, I do share a lot of food. Um, and then I take, um, typically I'll take a sifted compost. I do have a sifter and I'll sift some of the, the sticks out of the, the rough compost because it does come with sticks and some other things in there that are harder. But a big seed like this isn't that um, tough to cover. They're pretty um, versatile. so. Then I'll just lightly cover them. They don't need a lot of cover and I will then pack it down a little bit. Um, sometimes just grab another tray, just like this one, just to kind of get that seed to soil contact. Pretty 
press it in a little bit maybe and then I'll give it a good give it a good watering and um, at this stage I sometimes opt for bringing this up into my living room and putting it in my other tray that's up there um, because it doesn't need light until they sprout and I have a space capacity so I'll water this in um, up there put it in my living room have approximately 70 degrees or 66 68 degrees up there um, seeds like it when they break through I'll then prioritize and see if I can get them into this mix so they have the light here um, and that's that's pretty much how it goes. So hope that you found that informative. Um, I always do label my things as well. So I'll take a half of a stick here and I'll write the variety of spinach and the date that I sewed it on and I'll stick it into the pot. And that's my story. All right, Jason, that is an excellent story. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we got some questions that I think we can give directly to you during our Q&A at the end. So um, don't move, don't touch that dial. We will be getting back to you uh, with our discussion and Q&A at the end. So thank you, and your basement's looking good. Very productive. Thank Thanks, Anna. All right. Now our next presenter will be uh, Julie Rawson. She is again Nofa Mass's executive director and farmer at Many Hands Organic Farm. Uh, and Carol Roselle, our education director, will be assisting with the presentation on that end tonight. So Julie, um, if you want to unmute yourself, and Carol, uh, you now have the presenter role, so you can uh, start to show your screen. And I see Julie. All right. So Julie, uh, the webinar is now yours. You can take it away. Okay. I think uh, Carol is going to show some short videos that I took on Monday, I think. And right in here, we're just showing you how we uh, we make we get our our seed seed starting material, our potting soil from Ideal Compost in New Hampshire. He's one of he's one of the bulk order um, suppliers, old friend also. And it, we uh, sometimes when we're, we're well organized, we put all the seed starting um, material in these trays, which are open flat trays that are 10 by 20. And then underneath them, we have a, a web kind of tray that they sit in to add more structure. And we we go through a lot of trays in a year, so we are constantly, uh, you know breaking them and such but they they can you can use them for a while longer if, if you have those nice trays in there so um, when we are once we get those into the tray then we either, we either do it before we put it in or or um, afterward we will use our seed starting um, fertility protocol which is a, a lot of different minerals um, in this case we put in our transplant solution is uh, rejuvenate Sea Shield, Photomag, uh, Sea Stem, Holocal, Sea Crop, some manganese, copper, and mycogenesis, which is a um, inoculant. And these are all just to help um, really get the things, seeds off to a really quick quick start. Here you see some of the products we use almost exclusively um, products from AEA at this point, um, advancing eco agriculture. Um, here's the where we we set them up on this freezer and then we start the seeds in there. There's some more of the stuff that we buy. Um, we had a really good experience this week. We on Monday we planted a bunch of lettuce and brassicas and they were up by Thursday and out in the greenhouse already. So three days. You want to have your seeds um, really uh, germinate quickly and grow well and without checking or just keep keeping optimum circumstances for them so that they can get right into it um okay just showing a few more of our things that we use in our our protocols for our plants um here's claire getting ready to plant the, them when we coat our all of our seeds in biocoat gold which is a another fungal um, bacterial inoculant we just throw a little bit in each of the seed bags and then they, they're covered nicely so we are fast and furious at many hands and there you see claire just putting out about 200 in a flat 
um, just laying them out in rows, ten, a rows above 10 by 20. Um, in this case, sometimes like uh, tomatoes will be much, much less, you know, maybe 50 in a flat like that. Um, but these smaller things that are um, lettuces and brassica, th things like that are gonna be about 200 in a, in a plant in a flat. So we have these uh, also mark label the uh, sticks and I see that they're on kind of on their side. And the reason that is because when we put them outside and then take the reme off and on, um, it doesn't yank those out of the soil. Um, just a, a little um, something we've learned over the years to keep track of them. As soon as we have them all um, covered, just showing you a little bit of our our basement and then and we have you know we do about fifty thousand dollars worth of produce every year and have always kind of done it out of our house um so this is our basement and then pretty soon we're going to walk into the greenhouse which is an attached solar greenhouse and at that point we <clears throat> put uh, a little more potting soil on top of them pat it down like jason did and if we haven't watered them already we'll then water those in place with that nice drench that we put on them um, you can see uh, our greenhouse is not very big. It's 10 by 14. Um, it, it's attached. It's solar. We're we're big into not using any more any more um, basically oil and gas and things like that than we have to. So start these seedlings rather late. We just started um, on Monday. We started the brassicas and lettuce. Uh, last week before that, we started on our leeks and onions and parsley. Um, and part of that is that it's it's cold and the house I mean we have it's warm on a sunny day obviously in the greenhouse it doesn't get doesn't get below 50 at night but it's um, really want to make sure that the seeds are have the, the ultimate kind of experience for when to when to germinate um, you, know, you see this uh, I showed you the back of the greenhouse a minute ago but that we don't put a whole lot back there because at this time of year, the sun's getting higher and higher in the sky and we don't get much um, coverage. We wanna keep them from being leggy. Here they go outside. Um, we put them in our, uh, our hoop house, which is uh, just a um, single layer of plastic and no extra additional heat again. And this time of year, we will cover them with Rime, which is a spun bonded polyester covering. Uh, and at least at night, sometimes during the day, a couple of these rainy, cold days that we had this week, we didn't um, take the covering off at all. But we have a hose that we run in, into the greenhouse, and then we're able to uh, water right onto those plants and make sure that they're well, well moistened. And here's Claire just covering that up all the way for the evening. We actually open those houses. There's a front and a back door. These are this is a 66 foot long house. Open the back door and the front door on sunny days because it can get rather hot. We get a lot of nice airflow in there and monitor it that way. Looks like we're running that one again, Carol, for some reason. You want to move on to the next slide? There we go. So um, I didn't have any seedlings to show you to foliar, so I wanted to show you how we, we foliar um, almost all of everything on the farm. We are hoping to get a big a big tractor driven um, tractor driv driven behind, you know, uh, sprayer um, this year. But for now, we're just using a backpack sprayer. This is a solo variety. They break down a lot. All of the backpack pairs we've had have break down a lot. We have to really constantly Play with them to make them work but um, basically go up and down uh, once a week on all of our plants in all of our all of our, our fruit trees etc with a foliar mix and i actually have recipes for all these things that i put on if anybody would like to get any of our recipes um, you can just send me an email at juliet nofamass oh sorry or juliet imhoff.net i guess mhof.net or nofamass.org either way and i can send you our recipes so um that's about it i think for our see there we go that's me and jack in the in the barn <laughs> wow julie that that is wonderful and very very intricate but seems like very easy to do to a certain degree so uh, yeah. wonderful wonderful presentation just like jason hang out stand by we'll have our discussion and q a 
towards the end and we have a lot of questions that came in. So thank you so much. All right, so we've heard from Jason, we've heard from Julie. And uh, Julie, you can go ahead and put yourself back on mute. And now we are going to uh, round out our presentation uh, this afternoon with Richard Robinson over at Hope, uh, Hope Hill Farm. We also have a handout that you can pull off of this, um, off of our GoToMeeting uh, dashboard. Uh, and he will be talking about his operations and his farm. And if you have a problem pulling the handout, just let me know. Um, send me your email and I'll get you that handout. And uh -huh. Richard, you are all set. Thanks, Anna. Thanks very much. Uh, just before I, I get started, I, I just uh, I wanted to say it's it's kind of amazing to hear the variety of ways people do the same job. And it reminds me of something that um, uh, the the uh, the founder of Vermont Compost said is that he was talking about garlic. He said garlic loves to grow, and plants love to grow, and and there's a lot of different ways of doing what we do. Um, I'll show you mine. I'm going to switch over to uh, a sort of a film and slide presentation I made. Uh, and if all goes well, I'll walk you through it. Let's see. Can you all see that? Is that all right, Anna? Can we see this? Yes, right. we're seeing it. We are seeing it. All right, so we're down in my basement here. Uh, this is my seed starting room. I'll walk you into it in just a second. It's six feet wide here. That door is uh, about two feet wide. Um, and it's, we'll see in just a minute. Uh, it's got so, two sets of shelves, one on either side. There we oops, we lost it there. That's fine. Uh, shelves on either side uh, with a central aisle down the middle. I found this to be an extremely uh, versatile, uh, simple to make, and, and extremely useful uh, addition to my farming operation. Um, there's a rolling cart. You can see it toward the end there of the aisle there. Rolling cart that goes back and forth that uh, helps with watering, seeding, and everything else. The room is about 13 feet long. Uh, you can barely see there on the, on the front left side. That's where I do my potting. I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, and then the banks of lights, uh, just like Jason, I use four foot shop lights. Uh, these are T8 fluorescents. Um, they are, uh, I have not yet tried LEDs. I keep kind of uh, inching toward that and then backing away from it because I just can't quite figure out what the right system is. So I'm, I'm pretty happy though with these fluorescents. Well, the nice thing about fluorescence versus LEDs is that they're warmer. Um, and uh, down here in my basement, which is even colder than Jason's, uh, it's really nice in February to get that heat. Uh, the plants really love it. Um, I use uh, three lights. You can see there at the top, three lights per shelf. Uh, and I've got four 1020 trays uh, under each bank of three lights. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of what's growing on each one of them. Uh, these are the pepper starts um, a few days before I took this, the beginning of the week. These were up on top of the very uh, top fluorescent lights. Peppers really, really want heat to get started. And if you don't give them heat, they'll just sit there and they'll sit long enough to mold before you get them started. But if you give them heat, well, they just pop right up. Uh, down below that, uh, these are artichokes. If you've never grown artichokes, it's a trip. Um, they, you really can grow them in New England. You have to convince them, though, that, that um, uh, they want to do in one year what normally takes two years. And the way you do that is to start them and then get them outside early while it's still cool outside, not frosty, but cool, um, so that uh, they think they've been through a California winter. Uh, and then they'll flower. They're biannual, but you can, you, the, the Imperial Star and there are a couple of other varieties, you can actually uh, trick into flowering in their first year. Um, they don't overwinter well in the soil. We've tried that, and, and maybe one out of 30 plants will, will survive. Uh, but um, you know, we don't make much money on them, but, um, but we try it every year. Uh, down below that, we have a, a tray of uh, lettuce that has just sprouted. That's, that's uh, two days up there. And then behind that, um, some asparagus. We're growing asparagus. There's some more asparagus on the side. We're growing asparagus from seed for the second time this year. We're trying to, to increase our asparagus crop. And uh, rather than buying the, the plants uh, from one of the big nurseries, 
uh, we bought seeds and um, we've really been happy with um, with the way these plants just pop right out. Uh, they, they send up uh, shoots. Um, these now are just about to go out to the hoop house so I can make some more room in, the, in here. They will uh, sit out in the hoop house for probably until uh, mid-April, maybe the third week in April, uh, and then we'll put them in the ground, cover them with some row cover to keep them nice and uh, nice and warm while the, the, uh, while the weather settles. Um, and then down below this, uh, we have uh, something that we're, we're including now in our spring salad CSA, which are pea shoots. Uh, you can get a real nice crop of pea shoots in a 1020 tray. You uh, soak about a cup and a half, two cups of, of um, uh, field peas. You can get those from high mowing or from somewhere else. Soak them uh, overnight and then spread them out in a half an inch of soil. Uh, about two and a half, three weeks later, depending on the temperature, you'll just get the most gorgeous crop of peas. Um, and we, uh, we cut them down and, and give them to our CSA people. And they are um, they're very well appreciated this time of year. Uh, we now we're going to go on and look at uh, there's my yeah. Let me talk briefly about how this room was constructed in case you want to construct one of your own. Um, I did a presentation at the winter conference about uh, this construction in more detail. Happy to send you the uh, the PowerPoint from that. But it's really pretty simple. It's made from two by three, screwed together. As I say, these, these sort of ladder-like structures are about two feet uh, wide from, uh, from the front to the back there. And then uh, they're attached, because I'm in the basement, they're attached to the ceiling joists. Um, and then I run two by threes as open shelving between them. Uh, and then I put my trays right on that. The fluorescents hang. You can see there on the left, the fluorescents hang from uh, just screws put into the two by threes. And I got these, this chain at Home Depot, I just cut it uh, about five, six lengths long, and um, makes it very easy to adjust. Um, I like this a lot. Works very well. It's gonna take us a minute to get through this here. Uh, we do uh, almost everything in soil blocks. We do a little bit in flats, uh, but almost everything in soil blocks, and I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, inch and a half blocks for our, our faster plants, our smaller plants. Uh, lettuce, we plant a lot of, a lot of lettuce, bok choy, spinach when we grow it inside, uh, herbs, kale, flowers. We do about six, 7,000 seedlings of those every year. Two inch blocks we use for our tomatoes, our zucchini, our bigger plants, our warmer plants, our cucumbers, peppers. Tomatoes will spend three and a half, four weeks inside. Zucchini grow too big in that time, and so we're, we plant them a little bit later in the season uh, than uh, the tomatoes. I've got my tomatoes started now. Zucchini, uh, two and a half, three weeks, and they are, they're overflowing the tray, and we've got to move them outside. Then we also do onions, leeks, and shallots in, in flats. Those have already moved out to the hoop house. Try to put them in the ground uh, next week. And uh, we use the seed room from January to August, and right now is really the peak time. Uh, we are we're battling about uh, what does and doesn't uh, get started next and how quickly we have to move stuff out. Uh, we make our own potting mix uh, from uh, uh, peat moss, perlite, compost, and then small amounts of a bunch of different things, azomite, alfalfa meal, blood meal, limestone rock phosphate. Uh, all those except perlite available in the no for bulk order. So when it comes around uh, next January, uh, go right ahead. By the way, this recipe here is in that handout that Anna mentioned. Uh, we just mix it up in a, in a, uh, a big... Um, Big pot here, put the compost on, uh, perlite, the, and then uh, you can see from top to bottom there, the, that's probably the azomite, there's the alfalfa meal, there's probably the blood, mite, blood meal and the phosphate, and there's a little bit of, um, of limestone. We mix all that up nice and good, and the nice thing about perlite, perlite, by the way, is, is a, a volcanic rock. It, it looks like styrofoam, but it's not volcanic rock, and I love the fact that, that the perlite kind of gives me a good visual for how well the, the mix is mixed together before I start. This is how we make soil blocks. Um, we uh, put it in this, which is a mason's tray. You can get that at uh, the, home goods, the Home Depot stores as well. Uh, you add water until it looks like uh, a nice tray. And then 
put four blocks in for him. And then I want to show you that it's each the um, soil block maker has a little dibble uh, in each um, in each cell, so that you can put the seed in, and you can see uh, it's made little little indentations there at the top of each of these uh, each of these blocks. I've I've been real happy. We've been using blocks now for probably about ten years, and I've really been happy with them. Um, I'm not sure how much bigger we could get and still stay with blocks because they are probably not quite as fast. They are really good. This is how I seed my uh, most things, especially uh, lettuce and uh, tomatoes and peppers and things like that. It's called a vibro seeder. Uh, that little red button there will uh, make this thing right here vibrate, uh, sending the seeds very slowly down here. You can adjust how quickly you want to dispense the seeds by just tilting it a little bit or, or turning it a little bit, uh, letting them using them. Uh, this uh, control here to uh, make it vibrate faster or slower. Um, this really is, uh, it really is, this is how we do it. And then um, uh, lettuce will sit uh, in the cooler. We don't want lettuce to, to be warm, the, the seed if you get it warm, will go into dormancy and it won't germinate. It'll get very spotty germination. So I put these on the on the bottom shelf in the dark, uh, in the in the seed room where the temperature is probably no more than 60 or 65. Even now, when when the when the top is good enough for peppers, it's up to 80, 85. Uh, it, we've got pretty good temperature stratification unless I turn the fans up high, and um, uh, and that's good for lettuce. Uh, this lettuce has just popped out. You can see there what the texture of the soil block looks like. Um, keep it nice and wet. Uh, somebody asked about bottom watering. We put these in, a, as I say, in a 1020 tray that you saw, and then uh, I just I use a gallon jug and I just dump water into the uh, into the tray into this area right here and just lift the tray up gently and rock that back and forth, uh, and that's all these guys need. Once I put the seeds in, I put a humidity dome over, but once they pop up, that humidity dome comes off, and then we are, um, and then we're good to go under the lights. The lettuce stays in for about three weeks, uh, and then I move it outside. Uh, this, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, pictures here. I did this last year. Somebody gave me some, uh, some cheaper compost than the stuff I used, and I wanted to try it to see what it was like. On the left there, that's $25 a yard compost from Casella. On the right is $40 a yard compost from Smithfield Peat. And you can see that difference. Um, it makes all the difference in the world. Um, and the difference between these become even more exaggerated when these things went outside. Um, you could tell immediately uh, three weeks, six weeks down the line as those became mature lettuces. The, uh, the ones started poor compost, they never caught up. Um, so I really, uh, as a my advice is, by the most expensive compost you can afford. Uh, and then uh, we move our seedlings out, as I say, after about three weeks, depending on what they are, four weeks sometimes. Um, lettuce sits on our uh, east-facing porch, uh, unless it's going to freeze, and then I'll bring them back inside. But uh, lettuce will take uh, nice, cool temperatures, um, and especially after a few days, it's almost bulletproof. Um, I like to leave them uh, on the east-facing porch, though not on the south-facing porch. My number one problem with moving seedlings out is um, sun squall. Um, it's probably because my lights aren't quite strong enough to give them the the um, the, uh, the, uh, the instruction they need for for making their internal sunscreen. And so a few days here on the side porch where they're getting uh, full daylight, uh, that's enough, and then these seedlings can go in the ground. Uh, I cover them with um, with growth fabric after um, after they go in, and if I have to move them into the ground right away rather than leave them on the porch, um, I cover with with uh, probably three layers to cut down the amount of sun they're getting. I found that kale is even more sensitive than lettuce is to sun scald. Um, it's uh, pretty pretty um, sensitive to temperature too until it's been hardened off for a few days, um, and then it can take almost anything. 
tomatoes and peppers and, and warm weather plants like that, I do not want to harden off at all. I don't want them to be exposed to the cold weather. I, when, I'm, when they're ready to come out of the seed room, they go straight into the hoop house uh, and under multiple layers of row cover uh, until the days get nice and warm. And I believe that's my last slide. If you have questions, uh, we're happy to take them during the, during the uh, panel. And if, uh, as I say, if you want a uh, copy of the, the um, seed starting, uh, the seed room seminar that I did at the Winter Conference, just write me. Uh, thanks very much. Join NOFA Mass. We need you as our members. And Anna, that's for me. That's it for me. And I will try to get back to my screen. Mm -hmm. Do that. Okay. okay. All right. Wow, Richard, thank you so much. Uh, very detailed and a very uh, excellent operation you have there at your farm. And so now, since we have been well fed, we will continue with this meal and move right into our question and answer portion. So I'd like to ask all of our presenters to turn your cameras back on. And Richard, we are hearing a little bit of feedback. So if you can either turn down your speakers or maybe switch over to the phone and keep your um, camera on, whichever will be easier for you at this point. Uh, that will be great. All right, everyone. So uh, let's get after it and get into these questions. Um, there was a question that came in from the viewer. What is the best type of seeds to plant during this time? And Jason, you could probably start off with this, but our other two panelists can jump in on this one as well. Yeah, I expect dur during this time in season. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got, uh, I heard a motorcycle, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think it's mine. But it might be. Okay. Give me one second. All right, Jason, you should be good. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I think uh, as far as season is concerned, I mean, uh, <clears throat> right now it's uh, definitely time to put your peas in the ground. That's for sure. Um, and if you want to jumpstart on those peas, you can soak them, soak the seeds for four to six hours or so before you get them in the ground. Um, definitely brassica thyme, kale, broccoli, uh, cabbage, uh, cauliflower. I right now am about to seed my tomatoes and my peppers um, eggplant. So I'm not sure if Julie and Richard are ahead of that curve, but that's about where I'm about to seed those. I also am, uh, I've also seeded a bunch of winter squash beyond what we saw down in the basement um, because I really, <clears throat> The experience I'm having right now is wishing I had a lot more winter squash in storage. So I'm going to go big on winter squash this year. And um, I will put those out pretty early, I think, which is, you know, I'll get them out there mid, mid April and I'll put them under row cover. I have hoops and row cover for my garden. So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of where we're at. The, the cold weather crops, lettuces, the spinach, as I seeded. Um, definitely onions. Uh, well, onion, it's it's time to about plant your onions. I'm going to seed some more, so they'll be a little behind their shallots, actually. Um, but I bought I bought in onion plants, so I have those coming in a week or something like that. Now, I'll put them right in the ground. Okay, great. Richard and Julie, do you want to weigh in on that one? Richard, are you uh you on mute, mute, Richard? Maybe we can't hear you, Richard. Okay. We can't hear you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I unmute him myself. <laughs> Julie, if you want to go ahead and, sure. and start your response. Yeah, I, as I said in the um, my quick presentation, we started around the 23rd of March. Was the first things we started was parsley and leeks and onions and i as you know our system is totally different than these guys in that we don't use any kind of lights so it's all natural light for us 
and um, we want to make it make sure that the greenhouse uh, the house greenhouse is warm enough too so that's when we started those this beginning of this week we started with lettuce and all the brassica family actually we don't do any cauliflower in the spring we've had such poor results with that that we just have not going to uh, cauliflower in the you know for the fall but um, kohlrabi is another one to add to that list collards um, and then we also started a bunch of Asian greens like Chinese cabbage and a few of those other faster growing uh, faster growing um, Asian greens. Um, we'll start probably start some flowers maybe in the next week or two. We probably won't start our tomatoes until the 4th, 15th of April. And uh, Jason, although we're in the same state, is uh, probably has a lot lower um, altitude. We're at 1,000 feet. And it's a lot colder here, so we have learned to just really put stuff off, put stuff off. Squashes, um, cucumbers, all that, not until May 1st. And uh, then they go out in the field on the uh, 1st of, of uh, June. So that's a quick, a quick one. Okay. And I think, Richard, did you just call in? I just called in. I wasn't sure whether that was... Okay, is that is... Still, that, is it better? Good. Uh, now I'm going to mute my uh, speakers here. Okay. okay. We should be. Uh, so, uh, I don't have much more to add to that. Um, I don't know if you heard me say it, Jason, but I'm really looking forward to see what happens with the squash because that's that's early for me. I I will wait to put my squash out a little bit later. Um, the other thing, home gardeners may not know this, but it's important to to think about. Uh, wrong time of, time of year now, but in the fall, you can plant squash. Uh, sorry, you can plant spinach. Uh, and have it over winter. Uh, spinach is, is the most cold hardy thing that we grow around here. So not for planting in the seed, in the soil right now, but think about that for the fall. Okay, all right. So we're gonna move into lighting. We got a, quite a few questions on the types of lights that you all are using. Um, first of all, the distance between your lights and seedlings, uh, the types of lights that you use and recommend and to round it out, do you have to change out the light bulbs often due to spectrum loss or just wearing out? So, um, Jason, some of those questions were directed to you, but I think all three of you can answer those. So I will uh, turn the tables and start with Julie on that question, and then um, Richard and Jason after that. So I don't use any lights at all. Um, I really wanna go with that natural sunlight. I wanna make sure that there's no legginess. Um, and I think we've been able to figure it out to make it work for us to really start things much, much later, have things up in the front of that, um, in, the, in the front of that uh, uh, attached greenhouse. Even this time of year, you're going to get less and less sun in there all the time. Um, but yeah, we've passed that, passed that stage completely and just do natural light. Okay, very good, very good. Richard, would you like to uh, weigh in on that question? Yeah, I, I use uh, four-foot shop lights. They uh, You put um, uh, four-foot fluorescent uh, bulbs in them. They are, uh, the, the way, I think the way to choose a bulb, a fluorescent bulb, is, is on the light temperature. Uh, I, I try to put in 6,000K is, is how you'll see them at the, at the store. You can, 5,000K will work. Anything below that, I think, probably is too, uh, too red and won't put out uh, enough of the light that your plant wants at this point. Um, and uh, on the question of, of how long they last and, and turn them out, uh, the fixtures themselves, um, my experience, they'll last a long time, you know, multiple years certainly, uh, but you will every once in a while get a bad ballast on some of these cheap fixtures that Jason and I use, and we do use cheap fixtures. Um, you'll get a bad ballast uh, and then, then you have to replace the fixture. Uh, but um, right now might have been uh, trouble-free for a number of years. And the, the lights themselves, uh, again, they'll last for, uh, I would say, at least three years, uh, maybe longer. Okay, thank you for that. And Jason, um, you want to round this uh, particular question out with your response? Yeah. Yeah, I've had my setup down there for four years and I've been fortunate with no mechanical failure at all and the bulb are still holding. So um, I agree with um, with Richard and the research. I've done minimum 5,000 K, um, a, a daylight bulb or something like that, but 5,000 to 7,000 K. Um, I recently bought 
two, I, I doubled. So now I have four of those lights instead of two. And I ended up with T12s, but then in like further research, I realized that T5s are stronger. They're a skinnier bulb, mm, but the fixture is more expensive. You really can't find a $17. I wasn't able to find a $17 fixture for a T5 bulb. Um, and it is a trick to, you want to keep the, 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 you almost can't max, max out how much light they want. So as, as close to the plant as you can absolutely get them. And that gets tricky when you have a four foot bulb and you have some plants are just starting tiny and some are already up. You have to balance that out. So, you know, I'm always working with legginess on some plants. It's a balance that I have to accept um, because it's a limitation of the four foot plant and I plant small small amounts i don't have like huge trays and i don't have a greenhouse so okay all right so moving into some specific um crop questions we have a couple of viewers that had questions um and this one for you richard as it relates to asparagus a particular crop question uh can we plant seeds from existing asparagus plants that seed in the fall to extend our crop I'm sorry, can you just uh, say that one more time? Sure. Can we plant yeah, ask seeds? One more time, can we plant seeds from existing asparag asparagus plants that seed in the fall uh, to extend our crop? That's an excellent question. I don't really know the answer. Certainly, asparagus will volunteer. Um, it does absolutely, you know, the seeds for the seed is fertile, it will grow. I don't know whether um, the asparagus sophisticated of the world will think that's a particularly good idea, but it will grow. Okay. And another uh, particular crop question, uh, and this is posed to all three, um, I think all three of you can work with this, is concerning brassicas. Is there anything special that you do with brassicas before they go out into the field? Uh, this particular viewer is having some pest pressure with cabbage and broccoli, is there anything that can be used at the seedling stage? Um, I'm happy to talk about that one. I think that probably you have too much nitrogen in your system. People often use nitrogen, um, supplement, supplemental nitrogen, they get aphids and all sorts of other things in their seedlings. And I think if you can hold on the nitrogen and really go with a balanced, a really balanced potting soil, and like I say, I, I really depend on my foliars and my drenches that I use on my seedlings and absolutely no pests. Um, and that's, that's the goal is to not have any pests at all because you've got a really healthy system that they're growing into. Okay, excellent, excellent. Jason or Richard, would you like to weigh in? I have nothing I could add to that. I thought that was exactly <laughs> right. Um, and I'm looking forward to taking the nitrogen out of my uh, brassica seedlings next time I plant them. Okay. And yeah, I, Jason? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find that I am in a, just specific to my space, I guess I, I usually get like a pretty good attack from some mystery bug at the beginning of when I put my brassicas out, maybe grasshoppers wake up and um, come and take some bites, but then I haven't had much of an issue. I'm, I'm not stressing out my garden. I'm not uh, pressing it into, you know, massive massive production so things have a decent amount of space even though i do some things intensively um, i think you know make sure they have enough space so they're not competing with each other and the brassicas are heavy feeders so as, as julie was saying you want to give them food but maybe there's a you know over nitrogen imbalance over nitrogen okay great and speaking a little bit about pests before we move to biologicals and foiler sprays do any of you have any issues with groundhogs? Oh, yeah. Groundhog? Groundhog. Get a dog. I had my first groundhog sighting yesterday. Okay. We, um, yeah, but... we have four adult cats and, and many, many kittens every year, but we also have two dogs, and they um, keep groundhogs at bay. And I think if you can do that, if you can have your animals um, living with you and your and around in your garden, you can really save a lot of, uh, of grief. Okay. Yeah. 
if, if, are, if, if you are. can't get, I mean, I, I'm, I was going to say, a, a dog really is, or, or, or you know, farm animals really are a great way to keep uh, keep groundhogs away. If you can't, if if you can't keep a dog or, or um, some some big cats, uh, uh, a fence will work, uh, but it has to be tall and it has to be uh, something that can't go through, but also can't clamber over. And they will climb up a couple of feet. I don't think they'll climb up four feet. I've never seen that. Okay. And Julie, this is particular to you. Have you had, um, we're going to move to your greenhouse very briefly. Have you experienced groundhogs in your, um, in your hoop house or a greenhouse? And uh, what, how do you maintain temperature in your greenhouse? We just, uh, let me answer the temperature thing first, that we just go with what we get. Um, so I have to say that um, in the room behind the greenhouse, we do have a stove, which we sometimes will fire up if it's going to be cold, um, you know, and kind of a surprising cold snap. But I used to start things sometimes as early as February 15th, and now we're starting almost at the end of March. So we don't have much of that temperature, um, you know, where it goes down below 50 ever in the greenhouse. Um, and do we have groundhogs in our greenhouses? You say, no, we don't have them in there either. Um, I think it's the presence of all of our cats and dogs. Okay, excellent. Now we're moving I, I into. Oh yes, please. Hmm? Now we're moving. I have deer in my greenhouse. Oh, you have deer, and how do you handle that? <laughs> uh, I, I literally I put up deer fencing along the the bows of the hoop house to keep them from coming in the sides. Wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent plan. That's an excellent plan. Great. Now, if the three of you can talk a little bit about inoculants, biologicals, and foiler sprays. Julie, you talked about what you use um, and when you spray. But mm -hmm. uh, for all three of you, are there biologicals and inoculants that you use for your seedlings? If so, what are what do you recommend? What are the best brands there? You guys want to go first? Jason, you want to start us off? I'll, I'll go first just to say, I think I'm a few years behind Julie. Um, I use, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a rhizobia inoculant for, for the peas and the beans, obviously, um, and everybody should do that. I have not um, explored the world of uh, mycorrhizal inoculants or um, other uh, or foliar sprays. My, my, um, uh, my, my approach to organic farming, I think probably, peaked in about 1985. I think that probably was about when, when everything I knew about organic gardening was was current. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I haven't experimented with that much at all, though I'd like to apply some foliar, but um, I'm, I'm not there. Okay. Um, so I, I think that uh, foliar feeding is where it's at. Uh, I really... Um, you know, we use a lot of mulch. We use cover crops intersown on top of our mulch, and we do weekly foliars. And I started doing that hmm, four, five, six years ago. And we've um, now we've gotten rid of all of our drip tape. Um, our organic matter is, you know, rising up to the 10 or 12 points. Um, the the best seed coat that I would get is uh, the uh, BioCoat Gold, which is a product of um, advancing eco agriculture. Uh, when we do our foliars, we have uh, we use a few things: Micro 5000, which is a tiny old product, um, and then we also use Spectrum when we're trying to uh, bring more uh, more bacterial um, things into the gut. Like for example, today we sprayed all of our fields with uh, a C product, which is a crab shell product, and then this rejuvenate product, which has um, molasses and a, a few other things in it, uh, some humic substances. And then we used a product called Spectrum. So that was to really get things going in the fields. Um, mycogenesis is another product that AEA comes out with, which is more fungal. And that's where we put that in our foliars that are going on to the plants themselves. So a lot of that, I think they also, that really seaweed products, um, kelp products of all sorts are really very, very good for plants. They stimulate the, they stimulate the 
plants to grow in a way that is, um, you know, it's, it's hormonal. Um, it helps to really get them going in a good way and keeps the the um, apial dominance and the the root dominance in a good place so you're not growing too much above while you need to grow this below. Um, really important to use that. And then all the um, the minerals that we use, we have put in significant amounts of, of calcium on our soil in, you know, in, and on our plants with the foliars and then many, many micronutrients. Um, a lot of things you want to really stimulate photosynthesis. You want to make sure you have iron, manganese, um, and hopefully you have nitrogen happening in your system already. Once you start really photosynthesizing um, and building this good relationship between the soil and the atmosphere in this case too, there's 90, what is it, 94% or some huge amount of the atmosphere, 74, I can't remember. Um, mo most of the atmosphere is nitrogen. And when you can start getting that into the soil naturally and the plants fixing that, not just the uh, legumes, but all the other plants can fix nitrogen too. Um, we need to think about things like uh, molybdenum and cobalt, um, all these great micro minerals that are really um, will jack the system up really well for you. All right. All right. Thank you. Wow. What an in-depth response. And there's a <laughs> lot of food in that. Thank you so much. So as we begin to wrap up, um, I want to get to these final questions and uh, some final comments for the night. Uh, there were a couple of questions concerning damping off. When do you move your seedlings outside? Um, and then Richard, there was a particular question as it relates to why you do not have to put soil on top of the lettuce seeds, talking about your uh, lettuce seedlings in particular. So if we can round out our discussion tonight about when to put our plants out, when to dampen off and to harden them off. Um, I'll, let me, I'll, I will jump in. So on that question of why I don't need to cover the, the, uh, the seed, um, when I put the soil, sorry, when I put the seed in the little dibble hole in the soil block and then put the humidity cover over it, um, that seed is in a just about 100% humidity environment. And um, once it sprouts, that can come off. But um, while it's, uh, until it sprouts, that stays on. The, the reason of putting soil on is just so that the seed doesn't dry out and, and with the humidity dome, it won't dry out. Um, question about damping off, which is a, a fungal disease. Um, the, the only thing I do for damping off is I keep a fan going on the most sensitive uh, crops, which are the uh, spinach, uh, Swiss chard, beets. Uh, those guys will really, in my hands, really succumb to damping off unless I've got a a, um, a fan going on them. And that pretty much took care of the problem. Okay. And Jason, you would like to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think um, for most, where I am, the south coast of Mass, my, I don't know if folks listening um, or watching are in a relative zone, but where I am, uh, you can definitely beat the Memorial Day date for your garden. I would encourage you know those of you that are interested in pushing your garden a little bit more to think about May first for a lot of things. Um, maybe not your maybe not your tomatoes if you don't feel comfortable with that. But you know you can definitely get going in your garden like with peas now here, and you know you can get some food out there in April, late April. And definitely all through May, I'd, I'd encourage folks to grow kales and definitely get your broccoli and your cabbage in um, in April if you can. Uh, some of those greens, if you like Asian greens like Tokyo Bekana um, or Pak Choi or Tatsoi, those lovely, lovely greens. Um, those are cold tolerant spinach. Um, you you can really get going earlier than that that thought of um, where where I am of the Memorial Day situation where you put your whole garden in and let it go. And I would also encourage everyone to think about seeding numerous times throughout the season. So succession, you know, grow, grow a crop of lettuce in April, plant it out, and then three weeks later or something, however you want to do it, plant a, a seed another crop 
and you're going to put that out in another three weeks and it, it keeps you going you'll be able to feed yourself with with food if you succession plant so draw out a map you know draw out a calendar do the math based on what the seed packages tell you and maturity times and stuff and you can make a productive garden out of a very small space okay very good and our last question for the night can uh can you all tell us what usda zone you're in uh, we're in a, we're in five. You're in five, okay. Julie's in five. Richard, do you know what zone you're in? I I think uh, five is five colder than six, Julie. Or is five warmer oh, than six? It's uh, no six is it's colder. Sorry. Yeah, warm, six, six is colder. Warmer. I don't know. What's going on. I I'm <laughs> I'm uh, twenty miles west of Boston, and and we routinely get the earliest frost of everybody I've ever heard of. But on the other hand, um, you know, global warming. Mm -hmm. I think I'm six. You're six. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much. I have to say, and I said it earlier, we have been well fed tonight. We are hoping that you found this information useful. Um, we possibly may do a part two on this one. We'll see how our panelists feel about that. Uh, again, thank you so much. This video has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So please be on the lookout for that. If you'd like your own link, uh, just email either Carol or myself and we can get that to you. Again, I'm just gonna uh, reiterate, if you think any of this is useful, if you'd like to see more of it, um, please think about making a donation to NOFA Mass. If you are not a member, please think about becoming a member. You can join for as low as $25 a year. And that's how I got started as a member. So again, thank you. Next week, it's all about making sourdough bread with another NOFA Mass board member. Same time, looking forward to seeing you again. And on April 14th, we're gonna be talking about soil, uh, soil testing and how to set up a new garden. Thank you all for joining us. It has been a pleasure having you with us tonight. Uh, please be well, be safe, and until we meet again next week, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.